Mitzi Purdue, welcome to the show. Let's start with, I mean, you need no introduction, but um, you are Purdue. Yes, if that sounds familiar. Frank Purdue, chicken magnate was your your um, your husband who uh, fortunately passed away quite a few years ago, right? And, and you were also the daughter of the founder of the Sheraton Hotels. Is that right? Yeah, both are correct. My late husband was Frank Purdue, the chicken magnate. And he started with nothing and ended up employing 20,000 employees and uh, created a Fortune 500 sized company. So yay, Frank. Oh, and then, great. Yeah, and then my late husband had a story so similar uh, to what my late father had a, sub, a success story so similar to my late husband. And that is he started the Sheraton Hotels with no employees. And at the time of his death, he employed 20,000. So I got to watch up close and personal how some very energetic, successful people did. And then something that's going to be new to you is I'm writing a biography right now, and I'm about a third of the way through it, and I'm using gamification to the hilt to do it. I'm writing a biography of Mark Victor Hansen, the chicken soup for the soul guy. Oh, very cool. Yes. I've had him on the show. He's an awesome, awesome dude. Um, I know he wrote a foreword for your, your book, which by the way, is that, is that's out, right? Your book has been published. It's out, but the book, well, let's see which book, because uh, during the pandemic, I've written three books and, <laughs> and uh-huh. one of them is a small book about him. There's a publisher that creates books that can fit in your pocket or if you're a lady in your purse and you, it takes about a, maybe an hour to read them. And they're on people like Hershey, as in Hershey's Kisses, or Carnegie, as in Carnegie Libraries, or Disney, as in Disney Films. He, uh, she wanted me to write one on Frank, which I did. And she liked it so much that she asked me to do one on Mark Victor Hansen, wow. which, a book, which I did. And Mark Victor Hansen liked it so much that he thought it would be a good idea or that he would go along with, in any case, my writing a full-length book on him. And that's what I'm doing. Wow. Well, that's a good state. That, that, that's great. Good for you. I mean, that's on both ends. It's great that you were asked, you did such a good job on the other biographies that you're asked to do the, this one. And on his end, to be able to have a biography written on you is, is always a good place to, to know that you've done, done a pretty good job in the world. Um, yeah, I don't think he's suffering greatly over the fact that somebody wants to write his biography. Right. And I'm sure, you know, you'll have a biography written on you. Maybe I'll do it. Hmm. Mm, I, do you know what? I'm more fascinated reading about others and less interested in having something on me. Wow. Although anything that I can share with people, I'm eager to do, but I don't think a biography is needed for that. We'll see. I mean, you're, you're a very modest woman, but you've got a lot to offer people and you've got a fascinating story because I know it in and out. You and I have become good friends and I've We've, we've hung out, we've visited, we've actually in person done our, our, our play time in New York City and we played and we went to, to fun places and clubs and dinners and had drinks. And um, so I, I know what an interesting, fascinating woman you are. So I would read the biography. Let's put it that could, way. I, could I jump in with an editorial comment on our meeting, which might interest our listeners and viewers, which is you and I had talked for quite a bit before we ever met. And I was stunned to discover how accurate Zoom is. You really are in person how you appear on, on the screen. So your, your, your viewers, our listeners can, can take as a fact that how you appear is how you are. Oh, good. Right. Because you never know, right? This could be like, I could have some, actually, it's funny you say it. You know, these days I, they have these filters and I've seen some people on TikTok you cannot tell the difference. And it literally, it changes your entire face. Like it's like, it's like a beautification filter is one of them. I mean, they have different ones. And it started out with like the, you know, you change your face into a frog or, you know, you got like bunny ears and it's now morphed into like this, this ability to literally change the, the features on your face. And one of them, like this girl is talking and I just assumed that she was the person talking. And she goes, I just want to say, 
that I'm using this filter right now. And I've watched many people do videos and had no idea that they were using this filter. She's like, and this is what my real face looks like. And then she like hit a button and it went to her real face and it was completely different. And then she clicked the button again and it went back to the filter face, but yet you couldn't tell that it was being faked. Right. And I think they call these like deep fakes or something. Uh, so technology is, is, is interesting, right? It, it's, it's good in a lot of ways, but if you're not being responsible, some of these baddies can use it for bad. So hopefully, you know, I can start, I can see, you know, that can, that can end up going in the wrong direction if people start, you know, faking other people's faces and stuff and, and doing things that aren't them. Like, holy cow, that could open up a whole world of interesting possibilities. Well, I can't wait to try it myself, but I, I love uh, video because in fact, I'm, I'm not doing anything fake, but the camera is kind to me and always has been because, oh. well, I'm 80 and people tell me I don't look that way. So yay, yay. the uh, no, even, no, and I've seen you in person and I can vouch for even in person, you don't. Uh, I mean, you say the camera does you wonders. I thought you looked better in person personally. Damn. Oh, so. we, th this is why we're such good friends. I gobble that kind of stuff up. Yep. Well, I mean, and, and you know what, I'll tell you, beauty, people become certainly more attractive with their, not that you were ever unattractive, but I mean, knowing you as a person, I mean, all I see is beauty. And I, I mean, from Ooh. the moment I met you, it's pretty much been that way. So uh, who knows, maybe, maybe there's some sort of spell on me and you look like a three-toed frog. I don't know. <laughs> Help, you're seeing through me. This is getting worrisome. <laughs> um, all right. So Mitzi. Tell me about, okay, so you're writing this biography. Let's, let, I just want to find out. And, and obviously we're going to get into win this fight and your work with, on human trafficking. And, and I know that you have a lot going on. So let's kind of go through it and talk about, you know, the things that you are important to you now and that you're working on. And um, other than, as I said, we just talked about this Mark Hansen book, which by the way, did you just start that or how far along are you? In his uh, I started it two weeks before Christmas, and I would say I'm a third of the way done. Oh, nice. Okay. Good. And I've, I've interviewed, it's close to 100 people now. You know, in many days, I'd be interviewing five people a day. Wow. That's, that's great research, right? So you're not- No, just... and I have, I have, I'm told, you know, if anybody's writing a book, this is something that was new information for me, but um, maybe 10 years ago, a 250 page book was like a good size. Now that's too long. Now instead, yep. yeah. Now they, I, my publisher said that they're thinking sixty thousand words, which I think is like maybe one hundred and twenty-five pages. But I'm telling you, the shorter and shorter going down and down. It's part of this. It's part. It's part of the. You know, you got to take some and leave some with this. The world being gamified. You know, I mean, that's that all ties in the technology and people being able to just click a button, get whatever they want. Um, you know, you look at TikTok especially and and even now instagram has has copied them and so has um youtube when you look at the videos that do well it, they're all under a minute it's those short ones right and now even like six seconds is like the sweet spot like you look at tiktok the ones that are going viral five six seconds and it's like all right it makes it hard for people like us i feel like i'm trying to get my message out there i'm like how can i convey what I'm trying to say in six seconds here. And so it's become quite a challenge, but what would the world be without challenges? It wouldn't be fun to play the game now, would it? Exactly. And, you know, I'm even to a tiny extent using a little bit of gamification in, in the structure of what I'm writing about, Mark, because the, the way I framed the whole thing, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mark Victor Hansen, let me just tell a little speck about who we're talking about. Mark Victor Hansen is the co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, and he has sold half a billion books. He's in the Guinness Book, Book of World Records for selling half a billion yeah. books. I mean, that's one heck of a lot of books. Pretty impressive. Uh, but that's not at the end of what he's done. Uh, that man can make a quarter of a million dollars for, three day, for a three-day speaking assignment. I mean, can you imagine being so successful and so sought after? His books have been published in 57 different languages. Wow, that's amazing. And he's, that's, that's something to aspire to for okay. me. And he's had 57 books, different titles, 
been on the New York Times bestseller list. There's there's nobody who's done that. That's unreal. Yeah, well, that's it's totally like unreal. So the gamification sort of aspect of what I'm writing is a lot of people know him through his books, through his lectures, through his YouTubes. But I'm saying it's a mystery story because what's the man behind the public facade like? And I ask you, what's the people, avatar? Yeah, who's the avatar behind the video game? Yeah. Okay, so so I asked the question and I, I drop clues throughout. Is he, as some people say, just a prom promoter, a flim flam man? The guy like, do you remember the music man? There was a guy named Howard Hill, who was an absolute fake, just a shady promoter, but boy. Like a snake oil salesman is what they yeah, used to call, yeah. right? Yep. Or on the other hand, is he St. Mark? As in like the biblical St. Mark. Yeah. Mark Victor Hansen, because I, I've, I've interviewed people who said that he just changed their lives from suicidal to millionaire. And then it was a mental attitude that, that he imparts with these books. So is, is, yeah, what is the real Mark Victor Hansen? Mm, I love it. See, now that you are so smart, right? Because just by, by you doing that, it's made me want to read it more. And I guarantee everybody, every other listener out here, because you know what you're doing part. One of the, one of the aspects of gamification is making like, not to use the word boring, but the mundane type of stuff, exciting and interesting. And to make you want to, to take the action to do it. And everybody should read this because I'm sure everybody would get something great out of it. And he is a fascinating guy. And all these stats you just mentioned. Yes. Uh, uh, unbelievable. But Actually, now you I try in, in every page to have, a sort of conflict between is I mean, just page by page. So awesome. I guess, hey, what, what if I'm writing one of the early gamification biographies? Ooh. No, I love it, Mitzi. I, I, I love that you're doing that. Um, ooh, I can't wait to get my hands on it because because then it's almost like you're reading, right, you're, you're reading a biography, but it, 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 it's slash like murder mystery slash... Yes you know, one of these, like these things that everybody, these fiction that everybody wants to read, which is like, oh, who done it? Like, what, what's going to happen at the end? Uh, so. Okay. And I actually, as, as you read along, you, you really don't know what the end is. I have an end in mind, but you're not going to know it until you've, until you've read the different clues. I and like then there it. is another part to it, which is, and I'm not a hundred percent sure how one weaves these together, but Mark is one of the most successful people on the planet. I mean, if, if you can charge a quarter of a million dollars for three days of this man's presence, which is what he gets. I mean, that's what he charges along with first class uh, tickets for himself and his wife to wherever he's invited. I mean, that's serious money. You, yeah. People want to hear you. So what I'm including in the books, um, maybe it's little rewards along the way. Um, yes. Little nuggets. Little nuggets of what some of the attitudes were, were that that makes him do it, that, that gets him that far, and things that the, the reader could could make use of. So I've I've sort of seasoned the murder mystery. This could be the first, like you said, this could be the way that people do it for now on, because the world is changing. People, like we just said, they're not gonna read a 500 page. I mean, my grandparents, you know, it was like they'd read the encyclopedia. You know, it's like, oh, wow, we just bought a brand new set of cyclopedias from the guy that showed up at the door. Then my parents' generation, it was like, all right, 500 page book. Is it good? All right, let's go. Then, you know, went down to 250. As you said, now it's 150. I mean, this is where things are heading. You got to give people, you got to keep people interested. And they're, they're, it's an ADD culture we're living in whether you have it or not, I feel like in, uh, to a certain degree, everybody's got some degree of it. And the culture that we're living in is promoting that sort of like, Ooh, look over there. Ooh, grab this. I'll do that. Cause I mean, you can be watching TV. You can have your iPhone open. You can have your computer open. You can have your laptop. You got eight different things to choose from on TV. Is it Netflix? Is it Amazon? Is it, is it Hulu? Is it, you know, Apple TV? I mean, it's no wonder our brains are like, and, and it all ties into this stuff, this gamification stuff we're talking about, which is like, if you're not careful and you don't use this stuff responsibly, uh, you know, you're, you're going to end up in trouble. And that's why, ironically, even though we have so much more at our fingertips and we look at how our parents lived in terms of the amount of money that they 
that they lived on and, and the size of their homes and, and these types of things versus the, the standard of living today. And it's way higher. It's, just, but, it's breathtaking. But we're getting less happy. I mean, that's a fact. Like we're, we're, we're becoming less happy. You know, there's, there's multiple studies that have been done. The World Happiness Report, teen suicides at an all time high. Um, you know, because these teens go on, especially with the females, they go on to compare themselves to these to these other teens and, and people on on social media and say, and again, and then we like we were talking about with this deep fake, it's going to make it even worse. Now people oh, just go on and make themselves look beautiful automatically. <laughs> so you know, it's people like us. We gotta we gotta look out for the world, and we gotta start flipping it into good. Well, you you did something of just incalculable value to me, and it has to do with. What is it? The social media. What was the rest of the title? Social, the social dilemma. Social dilemma. Yeah. Uh, here's how you won me a million points. And thank you very much for recommending that I watch that. Uh, the publisher of the proposed Mark Victor Hansen book has a publicist in mind. It's the person connected with the social dilemma. You're kidding. And, no, I mean, is, is that not fabulous? And, uh, I felt so good because when the publisher was talking with me about, about the potential publicist, I'm, you know, I, I'm able to say, oh yeah, I watched that. It was so great. Oh my God. That's, well, I'm glad I could help. Uh, and it, and that, that was, to me, that was a very poignant, poignant uh, documentary that we, people needed to see it at the right time in history. I mean, it really nailed to me what's going on and the stuff we're talking about. So kudos to them. Well, the publicist, you know, of course loved the social dilemma, which I think she also likes. I, I she's she's seen some like sample chapters of it, and my impression is she thinks I'm on the side of the angels. Oh my um, God. Well, because the kind of message that that Mark Victor Hansen gives is it's very uplifting. It's very self empowering. It's it wants you. The message is about helping you feel more alive, more more being all you can be. That's it. Right. Um, and he, so I've had him on the show and him and his wife, Crystal, she's amazing. And yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, he, he's got a gift for sure. He's just got this just wealth of knowledge. It's almost like he's always in flow. The answers that come out of his mouth, you're just like, how do you know that? However, however, there is another side. Uh, his first marriage was a failure. His relationship with his publisher was not smooth. Uh, his relationship with his co-author, they're still friends, but it didn't last. Uh, so there's, there's, you know, it's, it's not just a straight line of perfection. Oh, no, it never is. It never is. It's never a straight line. And anybody that tells you that they are a snake oil salesman. And if they say they can sell you the elixir of life for nine 99, run for the fucking hills. <laughs> well, I, I, I told Mark, I, I actually, I'm not going to show him the whole book, but I did show him the introduction about how it's going to say, is he, uh, is he the, this, the flim flam promoter from the music man, or is he St. Mark? And, you know, I listed three reasons why he might be the flim flam promoter. And I'm waiting for him to jump down my throat and say, stop that. And he said, no, I love it. I love it. He, he, he recognizes that, you know, where nobody is in a straight line to success. Now mm -hmm. there you fall on your face over and over and over again. Well, nobody wants to read a fluff piece anyways. Let's, let's be real, right? People want to know the scars and where the bodies are buried. They want to know the, the struggles on if the person did have success, because then they compare it to their own lives and they're like, wow, if he could do it. And he actually had some struggles that are worse than mine, even then I can do it. Right. Yeah. But I, 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 I considered it that he was a very big person if he can read, you know, some of the things that detractors had to say about him and say, right on, good. Can't wait to read the book, Mark Victor Hansen. Let us know when it's out. We'll, we'll help promote it. But I want to talk more about you, Mitzi. Well, um, as we talk about me, can we talk about this? Is that wine? What is that? No, that's an hourglass. Exactly. These and, uh, are the days of our lives. That's what that reminds me of. No, it's better than that. This is a gamification thing that just works so well for me. And I recommend it to anybody for any Ooh. task that you've got. Ooh, a habit hack. Let me hear it. Let me see it. I love it. Because when you're, in, in my case, it's writing a book, but maybe it's writing a report. Maybe it's cleaning the house, whatever it is that, that's a task. Um, I love to have the task kind of bounded. 
uh, by in this case, an hour. So say I don't, I'm not feeling like working right now, but on the other hand, I can do anything for an hour. And so I- Ooh, just, that's good. I'm okay, buying one. So she's holding, just for those listening, she's holding an hourglass. Um, like I made the joke, these are the days of our lives. Have you ever seen that soap opera? Like you see at the beginning, the, the, the sands of time coming down. It's black sand, but it's very, it's, it's very cool looking. It's, it's kind of globy. It's, it's rounded. Um, and you know what, Mitzi, where'd you buy that? I'm buying one. Because uh, Amazon. Buying, what is it? Amazon? Amazon. And it's not, uh, when you, when you say hourglass timer, you're, I think it's too easy to think something that's two inches high and just doesn't have. Right. It's, to it's it. huge. Right. And it's this tough. is, uh, it's probably a foot high. And I deliberately picked a big one because uh, it's it's so visual. Like it would be easy to set a timer on your computer. I've done it, but this is just no, so that's way motivating more. because you oh. know the time slipping away and you think, well, okay, I'll, I'll speak to me as a writer, but for, for you, anybody listening to us, yeah, you know, whatever it is the task that, uh, that you got to do. In fact, I, I love to call it what Mark Twain called your frog, your live frog. Mark Twain said, and this is another hack that just guides my life. Mark Twain said that if your job requires you to eat a live frog every day, start your day eating the live frog. Do the worst thing. I mean, metaphorically, your, your live frog is the, the biggest, nastiest job you've got to get done that day. Well, do it first thing because then you'll feel great about it the rest of the day. And if if your live frog is something that eh, you don't even want to start, pick up the hour class, turn it over and get it done. I mean, just give it an hour. And I, I have a mental attitude that when I'm doing this, do you remember in college, I don't know if they still have them even, but we had blue books where you had one hour uh, to answer a quiz and at the end yeah. you know, it's over and they pick up your blue books is is there anything like that still yeah there? no yeah yes yeah we had that type of stuff in college although i've been out of college for quite a while so I well i bet they have something equivalent where you've got an hour and no more well yeah. i have a mental attitude when i'm when i've got that hourglass and i'm holding up up again even hiding my face uh when i'm when i'm when i've got this hourglass and it's the sand is slipping through I have, the, I have the mental attitude that I have to work as hard as if I were writing an hour exam. That, you know, I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to get a snack. Uh, no, for one hour, it's just total focus. And then at the end of it, you've probably got something that you can say, oh, boy, I got that done. Can I, can I tell you something? Yeah. Because you and I have talked about the fact that we're like psychically linked in some way. And I think so. you know, let me just, you, this is so crazy that you're bringing this up. Okay. I literally, my last week's post. So if you go on to my Instagram page and you look at last week's five core Friday. So the Friday post that I did was literally on this and, and um, I didn't use the hourglass thing. And I love that, but I basically just in what you just said, is actually its own gamification hack in a way in that when you, and what I what I focused on was tackling the thing that you wanna do that's the, the biggest and most important thing and the ugliest, whatever, first and getting that done. And then everything just becomes, you know, easier. And it's like, and I actually use the system that I use, it's called CORE that I developed. Uh, it's an acronym for COMMIT obstacles and rewards. And what that is, is I make a commitment to myself and I, I do it all on these short-term projects, right? So it's like, okay, today I need to get this and this done. Okay. I'm going to start with this one and I'm going to give myself this amount of time. I'm, I'm going to make that commitment to myself. Okay. So it's like a contract. Then obstacles. What are the obstacles that can get in my way to stop me from completing this task? Like how could I possibly fail? And I know that for me, uh, I have little things that will distract me. Like I'll go down a rabbit hole, I'll see an email. And then all of a sudden I'll, it'll trigger me to answer another email. And before you know it, 20 minutes has gone by. No, 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 none of that. So you got to be aware of that stuff and you got to make sure that as it comes up, you push it aside. And then the reward R is for the reward 
And you can give yourself a physical reward if you want, um, again, gamifying it. But I, for me, the reward is usually just that feeling of knowing how great it feels to have gotten this, this, this monumental task done in, in a short amount of time and done it well. And knowing that I've moved the needle on my goals because I have my long-term, my midterm, and my short-term and I break it down. Because if you just look at your long-term every day, like you're never going to do anything because it's like, oh, that's so intimidating. You got to break it down into these tiny little little steps. And so I love that you're, that you, you, you're doing that. What you just said is the exact same thing. And I want to even add this element to mine of putting this hourglass because there's this, I believe it's Parkinson's law is what it's called. And there's a, there's a, it's a real phenomenon that when you give yourself less time to perform a yes. task, you will actually, your brain figures out a way to make it happen. Right. So think about when you're in school and you were studying and you know, that whole cramming thing, which people, uh, teachers and stuff would always say, no, no, don't cram. That's actually, it's actually a real thing. And, and it works because what happens is if you give yourself a week to study, you'll take a week to study. But if you give yourself a day or even two or three hours, it's amazing what you're going to be able to cram into your brain and comprehend and grasp. It's this, it's this universal principle phenomenal. Again, it's called Parkinson's law that allows you to do this. And what you're saying with this hourglass is a great way to put that into effect. You know, there's, there's something from the biography I'm writing of, of Mark Victor Henson right now that just totally underlines that because Mark, where he first started making real money, well, maybe the second time he started making real money, but he was 15 years old. And this was the time when the Beatles first came to the United States. Uh, Mark Victor Hansen watched them on the Ed Sullivan show. He was just enthralled by it. And he called a couple of his best friends that night. He said, we're starting a band. And uh, they asked him, do you know anything about music? And he said, no. Do you play an instrument? No. None of five people played any instrument. But they, they Mark bought a bass guitar. I think it's called a bass guitar. Uh, and his one of his friends became a drummer and another became an acoustic, whatever. They, 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 they formed a band and they taught themselves to play. Mark had never held an instrument in his hand before. You know, three or four weeks later, he's performing first at like retirement homes. Eventually they got to the point where, where schools would hire their band to play Beatles songs and every every Saturday they'd learn new songs of whatever was number one on the charts. Uh, and kind of the, there, there's two points to this story. One is that he had no training whatsoever in music, but he taught himself and he taught himself rapidly. But, oh, and he was also during a period when his classmates at school who weren't part of the messengers, which is the band, when his classmates might earn, I don't know, 75 cents an hour, working, you know, just some kind of cruddy job in, in the early 60s, his group could make as much as $3,000 a night. I mean, wow. so he's, he's making, the, the money's just gushing in because uh, high schools and eventually even some colleges wanted a band that was really good at playing Beatles music or whatever was most popular. But there was an overall point to all of this, which gets back to that hourglass thing and Parkinson's law of that, that you get that time expands to be to fill the time that's available for its completion. What happened to their schoolwork during this time? Because sometimes they were, you know, they were playing sets for, um, I don't know, clubs or whatever, and they wouldn't get in until like 11 o'clock or, or midnight. So what did that do to their school? grades every one of them their school grades improved and how could that be I asked Mark how could your grades get better if you've got this full-time job and, and you're, you're getting famous for being musicians he said since there was no time to uh, to waste when the the few hours that we had in the afternoon to study we didn't waste them it was just total focus we had to get it done before we we started on our our evening uh gigs oh man oh i love it yeah that's a that's a great great uh, analogy to use and that's exactly right 
um, while you're talking. He went from being an average student to being an A student, and he attributes it to the fact that he didn't have time to waste. Well, it's like, and it also ties to that other adage, which is um, you want something done, give it to, uh, let's see. Give it to a busy man. Give it to a busy man, but is it a successful busy, busy man or is it just a busy man? It should be a successful busy man because the point is like, if he's successful and he's busy, he, he can take on more and that's, you know, right. So yeah, I love that. I love that whole phenomenon and it's amazing. And, you know, I think it's a good, really good little habit pack, little gamified tip to use to have that hourglass. Cause it's like, okay, you could sit down and give yourself a whole day to do something and it's going to take you that whole day. But if you give yourself an hour, maybe you don't quite get it done in an hour, but I'll bet you come pretty close. Right. Um, and I well, just, I, I can speak from experience. I, I bought this thing maybe three months ago. Uh, it's, it's taken me a long way. It's somehow the visual sight of the, the time running through the hourglass. It's, it's, it's motivating. I, I can't. Well, you know what else I bet it does. And just while you're holding it, it reminds me of just our place in the universe and how, short of an amount of time we're here on the earth for especially when you look at my kids are really into dinosaurs right now and you know i, I even forget you know as, as we're going we're watching these shows and we're reading these books and it's like 65 million years ago and i'm just like and then it like kind of has like a little um thing that shows you relatively like your lifespan and how long humans even have been along and it, they have like they do it in, in sheets of paper that stack up to the sky and it's like we're like one sheet of paper, right? And then it's like dinosaurs, you know, were, were how far along, number one, how far back they were 65 million years ago, but then how long they ruled the earth for, for hundreds of millions of years. And then you're just like, it's just, it's like, we're, we're this teensy and they're like, you know, all the way up to the freaking sun. And yet we think, you know, I think a lot of people are like, well, of course it's just us on the earth and we're the only ones that have ever been here. And, you know, I don't really feel that way or maybe they do, but um, it, it's all relative. And you see this hourglass and it's like, Hey, you've only got so much time on this, this earth to live. You better make good time for use of it. Maybe, maybe that's why it's, it's, it's strangely moving to me to see the, the sand going through uh, and it, and it's motivating. So um, I, I think I want to start a business selling hourglasses to people. It's a good idea. Mitzi glasses, Mitzi <laughs> glass, Purdue, Mitzi, so there's something in there. Uh, and I, I'd be a customer. Uh, so, okay. So love that now. And what, what is, what is your goal? I know you're a goals lady, w w you know, with win this fight and human trafficking and stuff, you know, how's, how is that side going? What are your goals with that for the year? W what are you trying to accomplish in that front? Well, I had a strange thing happen. Uh, I founded an organization. It had something like 500 volunteers, but because there's a possible legal case involved in it, I can't get into details. However, um, I'm not part of the organization that I founded, uh, which I find kind of breathtaking. So, so where I am right now is I'm not associated with the organization that I founded, but, ooh, and, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing to realize how important it is to be part of something of, of an organization, but I'm not. So what I am doing is I, I'm working for psychology today. I write their blog once a week. I, there are about three organizations that I write for, and uh, I've also done some minor fundraising for other anti-trafficking organizations. And what I'm most excited about, and you know, maybe the blow of losing the organization that, that I founded, uh, there, yeah, one door shuts, another opens. I'm, I, the most exciting thing I'm aware of right now is the financial institution, UBS. It has a charitable arm called the Optimist Foundation. And tell me if this isn't something of just incandescent excitement uh, and that I want to be part of. The Optimist Foundation, the UBS Optimist Foundation, wants to attack human trafficking by eliminating it in one country. And the, the goal is to use every bit of knowledge that we have from whether it's academic or non-governmental organizations or foundations or philanthropies or academics, put all the wisdom and knowledge we know about 
eliminating trafficking. And that would include like rescue and prevention and restoration, just every aspect of human trafficking, bring it to bear on one country mm. and it's gonna be in Bangladesh. Mm. And uh, they chose Bangladesh for what I consider a fascinating reason that they, they looked at many different possible countries. Bangladesh has a population, it's about half of ours. It's the most densely packed country in the world. So 163 million people in just, I'm, I'm going to be wrong, but directionally, I'm going to be right. Looking from the map, it looked to me about maybe the size of Texas. Uh, so it's a very crowded country. Uh, but they chose it because the government and, and the civil society, like organizations that are fighting trafficking, they're all so eager to solve this problem that from the highest levels to the middle levels, every part of government and pretty much enormous percentages of, of organizations in Bangladesh want to attack the problem. And the end goal is, well, first eliminate trafficking in one country, but second, learn what worked and what didn't work. And I've talked with people involved with this and they tell me that they're perfectly prepared to find that things that they thought, oh, this is the answer, aren't but maybe some other things are. And overall, if everybody's working together, focusing on the problem, I think it has the biggest chance of success and the biggest chance of learning what will work to spread this to the rest of the world. Exciting? Very exciting. Wow, well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's really awesome. That's, that, that's great to know. And then if they obviously can prove it successful, right? Then it just spreads and, and other people will be like, all right, it's been proven. They've done it. So good for them. I love it. Thank you. Thank, and, and, the, and just because you lost the, the, that organization doesn't mean you're stopping what you're doing, which is a testament to who you are as a person and how passionate. Well, I can tell you that it was, it was pretty disappointing, but. Um, when did, yeah. When did that become official? Uh, well, it's still, there, there's some legal things going on that since I don't know which way it's going to go, I mean, I yeah, no, we don't need to talk about. It. Okay, let's let's move on to some more uplifting, fun stuff. So, other than the hourglass, you know, we'll kind of wrap up the show here in the next five minutes or so. What are there any other gamification things that you're using in your life that you'd like to share with our audience? Tips? I mean, you've you've lived a long, awesome life, and you know, you've got so many successes and so many things you've done right. So it could be just a habit that you feel like you've developed that you wanna share with people, or if there's a habit that you've actually been able to gamify to make that habit even more successful. Love to hear that. All right, I have written 23 books. The one that I'm working on right now, it's just rife with gamification because, uh, and I, I wonder what I'm about to describe, I'm, I'm hoping it can be generalized to other things for, for whatever issues, people are dealing with themselves. But I, my hobby is computer database programming. And I have programmed it so that when I input into the database, which I created for writing the book, each time I say I've interviewed somebody and I have 1500 words of notes, I put it in the database. The database will have a running tally that will say, yeah, this one was 1500 words, but when you add it to the ones you've already written, uh, it's 80,000 words. Oh, that's cool. And, and it's just, it's, it's terribly motivating to me to see this number grow. And then from the notes, I translate those into actual uh, pieces of sub chapters. And so I have both the notes and then I have the, the more polished version of them, the kind of thing that could just go into the book and say 1500 page words of notes are probably going to boil down after I've played with them to maybe three or 400 words. But I put that into another section of the database and I keep a running total of that. Mm. And it, it's a great I, way to not to, to then and know like it, it kind of ties to that Parkinson's and then that but it's with, with, with amount of words, it's like, then you're not overwriting, you know, like we have 30,000 or, or call it 500 pages. And you're like, shoot, there, there's no way I can cram this down to 150 kind of helps you see like the space you're working with as you're doing it. Yeah, place. exactly. It's uh, 
being able to measure and watching things grow and knowing your constraints, it gives a structure to it that I find it, this is probably the easiest book I've ever written and not because of the subject and not because I'm better or less good at, at writing than I've been in the past, but the structure of watching the running totals, uh, it's, it's motivating. And, and why isn't that gamification? I mean, it is gamification. It is. No, that's totally gamification. It, gamification, in my mind, it's anything that you, any, uh, any way that you can use to make something more interesting, more fun, more engaging, reduce the friction of the tediousness, the boredom, just the not wanting to do it, right? It's tricking your brain into being like, yes, this is fun. I want yes. to. Okay, then, then I will tell you another ingredient of the gamification, which is, say the goal is 60,000. I have it programmed so that when I reach, say, 20,000, it goes blue, the, the running total. And then I have it programmed so that say when it's 30,000, it's, it's uh, I think it's yellow. And when I finally get to 60,000, it's going to be green. And I don't know why my brain wants to write just a little more each day to get to that next level. Mm, of course it does. And by the way, for, uh, I, I kind of hope that the principles that I'm describing work for, for all sorts of other things, but they're just little incremental rewards along the way and they're just colors but they count oh absolutely it counts anything right and and those watching right anything you can do remember your brain it just wants those dopamine hits right and so don't give it to it in the form of cheetos and you know binge watching you know things although you know we all have our shows and that's fine if, if it's on your own private time that you're giving yourself for it but you can motivate yourself along the way by doing these things and just just keep looking for ways to do it. And everybody's different and everybody's going to have different triggers and different cues and different rewards that, that they're going to, um, that their personal biology and, and way that they're made up and likes and interests is going to connect with more too. So be aware of that and, and just start looking for them. And if you see something, you're like, oh, wow, that was cool. That made me want to do it. Keep doing that because that, those are the little things that help to push us to what we need to do. Actually, can I add one more gamification thing? Of that course, please so do. So well for me. Um, I really enjoy tea. Um, I probably drink two or three cups a day, but I have this little rule that again, it just works wonders for me. You know, so tea is a very enjoyable thing. I like the taste, I like the effect. Um, I don't start sipping my tea. I have it a little warmer until I'm actually writing. So that kind of motivates me to get started because I don't start this enjoyable tea sipping. That's an actual phenomenon in an atomic habits, James Clear. I'm trying to remember. So uh, oh, also, also that's actually, that's habits. Let's see, is that habit stacking or is that pleasure? I'm going to go with just sheer pleasure because uh, you know, it's, it's a reward for getting started. And for somebody who's a tea drinker or a coffee drinker, um, I have invested in a warmer so that I don't, I don't just drink my cup, in my, oh, my case, it's tea. Uh, that, that tea cup is probably going to last an hour, but oh, it's yeah. going to be warm and nice. That's a smart one. That, that's, a little, that's a little gamification trick too, because you're, you're, you're expanding that pleasure um, out to, for that same hour that you're using the, the hourglass. Uh, my wife would really like that. I'm going to tell her about that. Although she's always on the move, but today she's working in the office. She would love that little warmer because she's always putting hers in the microwave and she oh, drinks wow. coffee, not tea, but she, he, she heats it up in the microwave. Okay. Amazon. Um, I mean, I, I, I find it so valuable. This is embarrassing, but true confessions. I actually travel with it with, with the, with the heater because, because yeah. say I'm in a hotel room and I want my little routine of enjoying warm tea while I'm working. Uh, oh. I, I, I mean, I think it probably weighs as much as, I don't know, six ounces. I, it's worth it to me to bring it with me when traveling. Yeah, that may be temptation bundling, um, but it's definitely, no, that, that's, that's an absolutely, that's a really good one. I mean, if you can just figure out ways, right, to keep yourself kind of happy and like that, so that gives you, I'm imagining that cozy, happy, oh, I'm just taking a sip of my tea, getting those dopamine hits. And to help reduce the friction of whatever it is you're doing. Love it. 
And you just gave three. I asked for one. You gave three really awesome examples of gamification. So thank you, Mitzi. Thank you for being on the show. It's lovely to see you as always. I miss your face. Um, can't wait to see you again in person. We'll have to figure that out. Oh, we did talk about doing something uh, in the summer. So we'll-, we'll, we'll Oh, start. yes, yes, yes. We have a goal. Yes, we do have a goal. So we're going to have to circle back on that. I'm, I'm in the weeds with a couple of these projects I'm working on. I want to get through over the next two, three weeks. And then I want to start, I'll circle back with you and the team and, and we'll, we'll discuss. Um, but thank you so much for being on. I'm glad we were able to get this done and recorded. And even though we had some technical difficulties earlier, I love you. Um, I love you. I love you so much. It's so good to see you. And I cannot wait till the next time we speak. I can't wait either. Thank you. All right, Mitzi. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That's it for the five core life. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like button on this video and pound that subscribe button. So you get notified when new episodes drop. Also, please fill out the free five core life evaluator quiz. It's a great way to get a baseline of where you are and the five cores and which of the five cores you need support. In addition, you'll get some actionable advice that you can apply and start improving your life in the areas that you need it most. That's it for today's episode of the five core life podcast. Have a wonderful day. Get moving, gain momentum, join the movement. Join Emmett by going to moremomentum.com to take a free life evaluator quiz on where you currently stand in each of your five course. 